Definitely. Um, so Athena, can we start recording? We are recording. Thank you. Um, let's see. So um, seeing a presence of a quorum of the Community Resources Committee of the Town Council, I am calling this January 12th regular meeting of the CRC to order at 4.33 p.m. Uh, this meeting is being recorded and pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended by Chapters 22 and 107 of the Acts of 2022, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately ask, access the proceedings in real time via technological means. At this time, I'm going to call the role of the Community Resources Committee to <laughs> make sure we can hear everyone and everyone can hear us. So I'm going to start with Pat. Present. Amanda is present. Pam. Present. And Jennifer. Present. And Shalini Balmilne will be absent today, um, as, as far as I know. Um, and so uh, just a few announcements before we go right into our agenda. This meeting is noticed as a joint meeting, but that joint meeting will begin at 5.30 p.m. with um, the Finance Committee special meeting and the Town Council special meeting. Before we, the only thing that will be on the agenda beginning at 530 is a discussion regarding assessment of residential rental properties uh, with the principal assessor, the finance director, and the town manager. So they will all join us and we will open two other meetings at 530 p.m. Um, before that, though, we're going to do the rest of our agenda and get through the rest of our agenda, in, including general public comment. I intend to take general public comment as close to 530 as I can in case there are Counselors and all that have joined us, they may be able to hear it too. But so we'll, I plan on moving to that around 520 or so, depending on how many people are in the audience at that time. Um, before that, we'll, we'll do minutes. And then for right now, we're going to go right into the review of the draft bylaw, draft fee schedule, draft regulations. We're focusing on the fee sample, fee schedule samples that are in the packet um, and the bylaw today. Um, we got through a number of the regulations two weeks ago. I, we're not going to touch them today. We're just going to do the other things. Um, with that, um, I would like to start with um, the bylaw um, and see if there were a lot of changes. We got through many of the sort of accompanying or or accompanying changes last week in the regulations. Many of the changes from the last draft we reviewed to this one were because we moved stuff to the regulations or we moved stuff back from the regulations into the draft. Um, I don't have any particular desire to go through each section individually, but if anyone has any questions or comments regarding um, any of the first, let's start with A, B, C, and D. Um, and E through the exemptions um, of the changes. Uh, most of the changes there were related to definitions, um, tying them directly to zoning bylaw definitions by referencing the zoning bylaw if they existed, um, and then splitting out the state law not preempted at the during um, at the town attorney's sort of suggestion was one of those changes. Um, any thoughts on those? three sections, and we're only going to spend a very short time on this before we get to fees. Um, we'll be in, within fees within the next 10 minutes or so. Pam. I have a question that maybe John could help me with. Um, in B, under definitions, there's the group home, and I don't know um, essentially what is, what is the difference between a group home, who constitutes a group home, like some of the, are they, are these some of the satellite fraternities, for instance, um, and and what would Mercy House be considered, which is right um, essentially at the south, south edge of the campus run by Mercy Church? Before you answer that, John, can I ask Athena to grant me screen share power so I can put what we're talking about on the screen for people watching? Now you may go, John. Um. Uh, so no, none of those um, things that you asked about would be group homes. Group homes would be things like um, that's, you know, houses that ServiceNet has around town. Um, they're residential facilities. They're licensed with the state. Um, 
Mercy House is um, just um, you know registered as a rental. They rent they rent rooms uh, to a to a special group of people, but still it's it's just a rental. Okay, but so there, I'm guessing that there are more than six or seven people in the house because there are always that many cars. Um, is is that a different scenario than any other rental property? I don't remember. I've been in that uh, place before. I don't remember that they had much more than four rooms that they let out. Um, good question. No, I mean, it's, I think it's not a single family home, but yes, it's, it's a slightly different scenario. So I'm just thinking ahead, we may want to better understand that category of building. And, and so how is, um, how is the fraternity on, I think it must be Sunset, near the Gillens, is that registered as a fraternity or, um, and so that falls under different rules? Yeah, fraternities, they predate zoning. Mm. So they're, they're a grandfathered use. Okay. Thank you. Um, seeing no other questions there. Um, one thing Shalini emailed me um, saying that she couldn't be to the meeting, but she wanted a couple things mentioned. And one of them was related to the um, exemptions here. Um, as well as mostly with fees, but but with this one, Shalini mentioned that or noted that some towns exempt all owner occupied rentals from um, either the fees or from even the rental registration program. Um, and we do not. Um, we've talked about when we get to the samples in fee schedules of, of treating them differently with fees, but we don't necessarily exempt them from applying for a rental permit. Um, and she, she just wanted to bring up that that might be something we want to think about um, with the thought being that owner owner occupied residences, particularly those up to five or six units, are likely to be better kept than others, um, including meeting code because they live there, um, was one of her comments. Um, Jennifer. Um, yeah, I don't, I, personally, I wouldn't, I'd be okay. I mean, we could discuss it, but it just, in terms of how it strikes me, that if there wasn't a fee for owner occupants, that that would be an option that we might consider. I think that anyone who is renting out a property though should um, have a permit, even if it's not, there's not a fee associated just so that, well, two things. So the town, you know, has a record of how many of just two landlords are. And then I would, you know, think there might be some special awareness that wants to be paid that those are up to code since people are renting them. But um, I would be open to, you know, considering waiving the fee. But I, I think that the town should know, who, you know, who's renting and, and, you know, ensure that they're safe and habitable, which is I, I, overwhelmingly the case in owner occupied, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. So I think for the town's record and for tenant protection, they should get a permit, but we could waive the, consider waiving the fee. Thank you for that comment. Uh, any thoughts beyond exemptions into the issuance denial and everything that went on in some of these changes? The application section changed a lot because um, we moved much of it over to the regulations. So there's a lot less listed here. Um, um, same with the process, I believe. Um, the fee section is the same. And then the requirements, this is where we, um, we moved a lot of it over to the regulations, the requirements, the inspection sort of 
how to do an inspection and stuff like that got moved mostly to the regulations. Um, that's the application. All of this red for inspections got moved to regulations, which is why there's a lot um, different there. And the standards got moved to regulations. Um, and then paging down, we haven't gone back and talked about consent. Um, that's one of the things we haven't looked at. Um, and then violations changed a bit. Um, this is one where what got moved was the point system. Um, and we, Pam and I have, uh, are working on potentially moving that to the nuisance property bylaw. Um, with then nuisance properties being, you know, a rental that is declared a nuisance property is subject to potentially um, suspension under this bylaw too for their permit was, was sort of what happened there. And so you'll see some changes here that now reference nuisance house um, and that bylaw. Um, was one of the thoughts. And I think we'd love to hear from you all your thoughts on that. Obviously, we haven't seen a new draft of the nuisance house. Um, the hope is to have that to this committee by the end of the month um, at the next meeting. Um, so, um, but but the thought is that that is what would govern that and that that could trigger a suspension or a denial of a future permit under this bylaw. Yeah, you want me to comment? Sure, John. I think that's a good idea, moving a lot of that to the regulations. Um, I think that rolling that point system into the nuisance house bylaw is a good place for it to live. That puts all of those noise complaints and, and um, other sort of complaints all together then, and you, you can do a better job of sort of keeping score of uh, addresses that way. This, um, this rental bylaw needed to be trimmed, so. Um, <laughs> That's an understatement. Congratulations. <laughs> Congratulations on finding other homes for, for some of this. That was one of the goals, wasn't it, Pam? <laughs> Definitely one of the goals. Um, you know, and then there's some movement there and all. Um, are there any other comments before we move on to the fees um, regarding the changes that, that were made to the between drafts for the bylaw since the last time we talked about it? Anything people would specifically like to discuss the next time? Um, you know, or think about, I guess what I would say is think about where you might be concerned given this draft. I'll make a clean version. There is a clean version, um, but I, I think our goal for this, the bylaw language now is to specifically target things individual counselors want to discuss in it or John or Rob, where we need to come back and say, hey, is this what we really want and stuff. So I think for next time, creating that list would be very helpful. Um, Pam. I think it would also be good for folks in the audience to take a look at the, um, the clean version, and again, sort of through their own lens, look at how it's now structured. The intent is obviously not to punish anyone; it's to um, it's to manage expectations and 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 results. So I think it would be really good for them to to look at it again. That's a good idea. Okay, so that's our homework as a committee for the bylaw, and I'll, I'll send out a clean version of the regulations too um, for the next packet. We'll put them in there. We will not probably be discussing either the regulations or the bylaw at the next meeting because um, we'll be looking at the nuisance house stuff and some other things, but um, I'll put them all in the packet, and the goal will be 
we might take 10 minutes to say, here's the sections we want to discuss so that everyone knows that those are the sections people want to come back to and other sections they aren't so that they can concentrate on. Um, with that, we're going to move to the fee samples. Um, in the packet um, are, it, are the answers Rob provided to the questions I sent him. I want to thank Rob and his office for providing those answers. Um, I used them in hopes of getting better estimates for fee revenue raising. Um, and so they were very helpful. And, and to do things like one of the um, the one of the tabs at the very bottom, one of the pages in the PDF shows some preliminary guesswork as calculations as to what does an inspection actually cost um, based on how many inspections inspectors can do a year or how long they take and salaries and things like that. And what does an application um, processing cost based on the people needed to do that? X, Y, Z, so that we could get an idea of what it's doing beyond Rob's own estimate as to how much the program will cost as the bylaw is written. What are some of the specific costs as we look at the fees um, to potentially cover those direct costs of processing or of inspecting and all? I will put the Excel sheet up so people can see things move, but Pam first. Yeah, I was going to say this is not trying to try to be not arbitrary on this we understand that if we want results it does take staff time and we are as a council cautioned to uh, make sure that new initiatives um, are cost neutral meaning they do kind of cover their costs by the implementation this is not actually a new program, but it is certainly going to be more broad, broad, widespread, broadly spread, and, and hopefully much, much, much better enforced because it will be clear cut. Everybody will hopefully be playing by the same rules. And we do understand that there is a cost to that. Uh, it would be great to keep it as absolutely low as possible so that the um, you know, the population of rental units in town is is not harm, harmed by it. Um, it's just that we have better better management of it all. Thank you, Pam. Um, the, the one thing I would say is if this revision of the bylaw passes, there is one major change that is new, which is that town staff would be undergoing all the inspections. Um, yeah. which they don't do now. And that is, a, I think, the major driver of the cost of this change has, um, in terms of the cost of the program is the fact that inspections, regular inspections would be undertaken by town staff now. So I'm going to see if I can share this. Um, I think you can, yeah, it's nice that they give you a preview of what people are looking at now. So. Um, I, I want to caution again, these are just samples. These are to give us an idea. We haven't fully set on um, a couple of things. Um, one, what the permit fee split would be if there would be splits in fees, things like that based on number of units or anything like that, or owner occupancy. And we haven't settled on whether an inspection would whether the required inspection would be included in the permit fee or whether the required inspection plus a follow-up or two follow-ups would be included in that fee. Um, so I could make many numbers of, of options here, um, but I stuck to, I believe, four. Um, two that included an inspection in the permit fee, um, the required inspection, either for renewal or for obtaining the fee, the permit, the uh, first permit, and two that did not include that inspection. And the biggest change you see from that is this line is zero in the two that includes the inspection, because that inspection wouldn't that inspection would be covered by the fee for the permit. Um, and so, the number I was aiming for down here in any option was somewhere in the 475 range to 500 range based on Rob's estimate. Um, the numbers I was aiming for in the base permit fee 
um, when the inspection was required was something that would cover application processing and inspection, uh, one inspection. Um, and so what I did there was I used these as a guess. Um, if you took a salary of an inspector and divided it by 2000 hours work per year and then timed that by an hour and a half, which was Rob's basic guess on how much any one inspection would cost, you get about $100. Um, if you times it by every hour, you get about $50 or $55 or so. And so I took one inspection to need about $100 to $120 of fees. Um, any additional units would need about $50 to $60 in fees for total for each unit per se to cover the inspection costs. For application costs, the $120 is, is based on the management assistant salary and benefits, um, the number of applications we issued this year, um, and the cost of legal, uh, the estimated cost of legal. And then what I did was divide the salary by the number of applications and the legal by the number of applications and add those two numbers together. <laughs> and that's about what I got. Uh, very rough numbers, but that's that gives you an idea of, and so when you put the 120 with the 100 together, you get at least 220 um, together, sort of for permit application and inspection. Um, and so that was some sometimes where I started with these was that number. And then since an inspection is included, that one had additional there. Um, on the other options, you'll see there's no additional because the inspection wasn't included, but then you've got inspections with additional fees per unit of inspection up here that sort of does that cost too. Um, so that's sort of how I got these numbers. They're, all the cells are linked so that you change a number, it changes the numbers throughout, um, which makes it easy to play with. Uh, Pam and then Jennifer. Um, just this is really good, thorough, thoughtful work, Mandy Joe. I have a going way back. I have a question in your. I guess it's at the bottom of this, and I frankly didn't realize that there are all of these options when I when I read the first page of that handout or that attachment. I saw the rental permit breakdown with the numbers that uh, inspection department had given us. I did not frankly realize that there were five more pages of options that you had put together. So I feel a little less than prepared to discuss each one in detail. But that said, at the very end, um, when you're talking about applications process per year, I thought we were going to be well into the 5,000 range because it's not, there would be an annual processing of all permits, whether, whether they were, you know, is that not true? <laughs> so it is. Um, but I, Rob can confirm this. We've issued 1,166 permits this year for a total of 5,000 rental units. Is that correct, Rob? That's right. Yes. Okay, so you're talking permits, not dwelling units. That's the way the bylaw is written right now is that it's a permit per parcel still. Okay. And and that we have, that's the known, those are the known ones. These are not the unknown ones. Yeah. Correct. Okay. We, we, yeah, we have, a, we have a very small list of properties that we think may be subject to the program that we haven't confirmed yet. Um, We've worked through several hundred properties that fell into that category by researching the assessor's data, uh, and and our permit counts went from you know 900 to 1166, uh, but we're you know we're down to the last. I think it's 44. John may know the exact number, but I, it's somewhere around there. Okay, so so we're still under we're under roughly 1200, approximately 1200. That's right. Um, Rob, you, that's, if it's still my turn, sorry. Um, Go on. Uh, you, the, the chart that you gave us was really terrific with the distribution by size. So we have, <clears throat> you know, the one rental unit per property, 
per parcel up to the 207 plus. So that was very, very helpful. Will we get a chance to get a, a download of the addresses that you're dealing with so that we as a council get a better distribution, sense of distribution across town? Once you've got your list, can we get a list of, can we get a copy of that? Uh, I'm not sure I understood a list of the breakdown between all of them or the ones that were the small number that we're working on. Uh, all, all of them, you know, where, so in this, in this array of, of um, call it 5,000 rental units, what are, where, what are the addresses? Where do we find these across town? So the, so break down the 1166 by district or something like yep. that. Yeah, we could do that. By, by street would be helpful. By street, okay. Let me ask. <laughs> okay, I'm sure it's doable. Uh, Jennifer. Uh, yeah, well, the first I wanna say is I really appreciate your the four options. I mean, because my head's been spinning when we look at all the different towns and cities that each have a different fee structure. So can we start to look at within these four? Then we'll fit in what we think the different fees should be. Um, yes, I would. First off, I would like to know if people have a preference given given some of this stuff that it takes to get to stuff. Did did anyone say, oh, I like. Well, I I'm like one um, and two better than three and four, say, including the inspection versus not including the inspection type thing, because um, then we can further refine stuff as we're looking at stuff. Or did you like options two and four better because of the um, non-owner, the owner-occupied exemption versus one and three? Like, if we can get down to stuff like right. that. I like the owner-occupied okay. exemption or some owner-occupied exemption. And then, um, then between... So between two and four, I wouldn't know. I, I would defer to somebody else's, you know. I'm invoice. wondering if, if we could have, if they care to, John and Rob also weigh in on this, because I'd like to yeah. hear their opinion too. Yeah, that would be definitely appreciated. Yeah, thank you. I can just um, mention that, <clears throat> um, you know, regardless of the fee, you know, I would say that it's not accurate to say that owner occupied properties do not have issues. Um, and, and I'd also know, note that there's been strategies by investors to put properties into LLCs, assign certificates to occupants and call it owner occupied. Mm. Uh, so, you know, there might be some consequence there to totally exempt certain properties from both fees and or the permitting process. I, I personally don't think anybody should be exempted from the permitting process. And I guess I was just thinking of fees being, maybe it's discounted within, you know, under a certain number of units, like five or under, I, but. Um, so I, I guess I, what I'm at, uh, in part asking is, when do we get to that level of detailed discussion? Well, let's finish hearing from people. Yeah. So Jennifer likes options two and four better than one and three. John, and then Pam, and then I'd like to make my comment. But I did want to add, when you said discounted, I thought you meant discounted fee. I don't think they should be discounted from having to get a permit. So that might have been my misreading. Okay. Yeah. So here's my um, question about this. I guess if they're if you're not going to charge them because it's an owner occupied um, part of its owner occupied, um, what pays for the inspection? Do the other properties in town pick pick that cost up, or how how do you manage the money on that? Um, that's one one thought. And another is, I've got several properties right now that I'm working on that um, are being represented as owner occupied and I'm chasing people for proof of that. So I wanna, you know, I wanna see your driver's license and your registration. I wanna see a copy of a utility bill. And, you know, um, these are properties that I don't believe 
owners live in, but yeah. they say they do. Thank you, John. Um, Pam, and then I'll go, and then Pat, and then Jennifer. Why doesn't Pat go first? I, I have some thoughts on general strategy. Pat. Well, I my question is, I, I don't, after what John and Rob said, it sort of strengthens my belief that we should be charging fees to everyone. And, you know, in, in terms of fees, that becomes the town's income. And rent is an owner's income. And they do make income by renting um, units, so even if they're owner occupied. So I think that there should be fees. And I also think that we've just heard two particular problems that may need to be addressed because it doesn't guarantee anything that a that a property is owner occupied and we're trying to make this equitable across the board thank you pat i'm going to make my comment one thing in doing this and and i'll admit since i was doing this i've spent a lot of time with this spreadsheet um, but the one thing I noticed in the difference between options one and two and options three and four is that it was a lot harder to get options three and four to raise the $475,000. Um, you'll actually notice that option three, uh, three and four do not include an inspection within the permit fee. And you'll notice that option three doesn't even reach that on the high end. Um, depending on how many follow-up inspections there are. Um, and it still has, you know, a raise in permit fee as a base fee for nearly every unit, not quite every one. Um, but when you add the required inspection in, it would be a raise for every unit because it would basically be for some units 350 a year every year, depending on whether they're, what inspection schedule they are. Um, and so I used to be favoring um, having the permit fee not include the inspection and the inspection separately because it was a way to reward units that don't need an annual inspection um, because they would only pay that inspection fee every three or four years or five years, depending on that. Um, but I think that actually uh, makes it harder to plan on income every year um, from the inspections side uh, because the revenue is a lot less stable when you don't actually know how many renewal inspections you might be doing in any one year. And so I, in, in that sense, I began to favor options one and two, the options that include the inspection in the fee every year. Um, beyond that, I'm not sure which of the two options I would favor, and there's obviously a lot of play with the numbers that can be done, um, but but that, that was something I began in playing with this, favoring the options that include an inspection fee within the permit, and it might even be worth potentially including a follow-up inspection. I did not do that part of this, but given some of these numbers, um, you might be able to even include a follow-up inspection, meaning if that regular inspection doesn't pass on the first turn, they don't have to pay for the second inspection either that comes back to make sure everything's been fixed. We might be able to do that if we include these inspections in the base permit fee um, to simplify the whole charging of stuff anyway. And then that's the question I have for Rob and John and all. Um, which system do you think would be easier to administer in terms of fee charging? Because um, that's also a consideration is, is what's an easier way to administer the fees in, in terms of options that are presented here. Fees, the inspection fee included in the permit or separate from it, that it would get billed separately. Um, so you can think about that if you don't have an answer right away while I go to Pam and Jennifer. Um, okay, thanks. Um, actually, a question to start out with for Rob, in the numbers that were um, uh, that you gave us of the cost basis, uh, it, I thought I read that there were that each inspector would only do 200 inspections per year. Yet currently, there were um, more like an average of 
740, I think I did the math per year. So I'm not sure why there would be so few um, inspections but per inspector. So it's just something maybe you could look back at the, at the numbers that you gave us and see if that's, if I'm correct. Um, I think uh, I appreciate the, the idea of, you know, what actually earns the money here. Um, I, but I'm, I'm actually have been leaning toward separating a rental fee from a, an inspection fee. I think we could probably address the issue of income flow because the number of rental permits per year is not going to vary significantly. And therefore the number of inspections run each year, if it's 25% of the whole or 30% of the whole could be calculated pretty, pretty well. So my, my feeling about separating a registration permit fee from inspections is that it could be a, it could be a, a reasonable number for for every for everybody um, with an emphasis on the single family duplex triplex uh, owners and owner occupants um, as opposed to uh, a property that has a lot a lot of units such as say Puffton Village, where it could perhaps be the same base rate with an added formula for the number of units or the number of building, buildings on the parcel. So again, separating permit fee from in, inspection. Um, as for the inspection fees, if it's a well-managed unit, no complaints, we've talked about that happening inspecting every three years. Long-term tenancies, tenants and tenancies, um, again, are three to five years or at a turnover. The complaint houses, the problem houses, the nuisance houses would get probably inspected every year. Um, so, so it's clear that it would be very hard to build inspection fees into permit fees and really hard to separate out, um, you know, I'll say good behavior from bad behavior without having to pass on a lot of cost to a lot of people. Um, with the inspection, I, I did the math a little differently. I came out roughly about the same um, target of approximately 50 to $55 an hour as cost for a staff person averaged out across over the year. Um, and then my only other question was in terms of complaint inspections, is a complaint inspection um, different and should it be treated differently than a standard inspection? I think, I think the um, information from the town came at, let's, I'm trying to scroll through. Um, uh, there was there was health code and then complaint and if maybe Robert John could differentiate to me if there's a difference in actual cost between a health code inspection uh, I mean a, a health inspection a code inspection or a complaint inspection thank you I'll, I can speak to that um, I'll answer that now um, so. When we go to one of these properties, we're, we're enforcing multiple codes, building codes, zoning, and health. And when, when I come back and, um, you know, keep the records on, on what the complaints were, they, they get categorized that way. It was a health complaint. This one had a health complaint, two zoning complaints, and a building code complaint. And then we sort them that way. We keep them sorted that way. And at the end of the year, that's those are numbers that that Rob uses when he, you know, um, goes for with a budget proposal. Uh, there's no there's no difference in, um, you know, looking at those things. There's no difference in the inspection. There's no difference in the enforcement. It's just uh, which bucket does it end up in? Uh, thank you. 
Um, Rob and then Jennifer. So just to back up a little bit, because I think this needs a little bit more clarification on the inspection numbers that were provided in the memo. Um, so there's complaint response inspections that I noted an average of 291. That's, that's the call that comes into John or gets directed to John that requires him to go out and, and conduct some sort of a response and start a, start a record for a property. That doesn't include the hundreds of things that John might deal with throughout the year that are, um, you know, a text message to a property manager to say, hey, move that car off the grass or, you know, bring your, your trash container back inside. You know, those, those little quick, easy um, enforcement uh, actions do not get a record generated just because it takes too much time to do that. Uh, that, you know, just so that that's the the complaint response piece. In number two, the, the large number of inspections, the question was non-rental related question uh, inspections. That's what the question was about. So that's a, you know, a building permit being issued for a roof replacement or a kitchen remodel or a house being constructed or whatever might be going on. The hundreds or thousands of inspections we do at the large uh, five unit or five story buildings downtown. So that's very different. That's a very different inspection. Uh, you know, some of those take a long time to inspect. Uh, you know, we have in, we have inspections that can take a day. You know, if we're at Amherst College looking at concrete at a, at a big project, or uh, there's a roof replacement that John might or an inspector might get out of their car, walk 50 feet, and walk back into their car and drive away. Uh, and those those inspections, those thousands of inspections that are noted there are, um, you know, a button on their iPad closes out the record, you know, so it's really quick and easy and dealt with uh, fast. So um, I, I wanted to answer the question with our, with our data, but I don't think it's useful when trying to figure out how much time is needed for a housing inspection, where an inspector, as John mentioned, is, is referring to several different codes and uh, working their way through a property, looking at a number of different pieces, including zoning. You know, so it's not just a building inspection, it's also on the grounds and making sure there's zoning compliance. So that's why I'm not suggesting 700 inspections per year for an inspector and somewhere between 150 and 200, knowing that there's prep work for an inspection, the inspection itself that takes the hour, hour and a half, and then there's follow-up emails, communication, and all kinds of stuff that happens afterwards that goes on for weeks on the properties that uh, you know are not a nice, easy, uh, you know, clean inspection. Thank you. So, so the number of inspections was was the whole bucket, not just the rental bucket. That the number of inspections did not include the rental piece. That was only non-related to non-rental related. Uh, that's not even the total inspections for the department. That's non-rental related inspections. Thank you, Jennifer. And then we're going to move on to um, minutes and public comment after this. Okay. Well, how, Rob, I was just what, not why I raised my hand, but just how many inspectors would you need in the, you know, ideal world? <laughs> well, I mean, for this program, you know, uh, what I think we need just for this program is uh, we need John's position. Who John's a lead inspector. So John can coordinate for other inspectors uh, for their daily work tasks. So I think we need John's position and to build two more code enforcement officers that are out there uh, doing Two in addition to who you have or two total? Two in addition to so who that, you have. So um, that would make how many? That would for the program it would be three. So it'd be a lead inspector plus two code enforcement officers out there in the field. And and I want to make sure that this is clear that we're thinking the same thing. I'm not expecting this to be complaint only anymore. So when we right. when we right. hired John and created this position, you know, it was very clear to me by the town manager that we are we are there for complaint only. We're not putting John out there patrolling, looking for things to correct. And John and I, we have this conversation all the time. In fact, we did yesterday that, you know, when he's going from place to place, he needs to look place to place and not all around him. <laughs> because 
because he truly just doesn't have the time to deal with what would come from that. Um, and we're not happy about that. We never have been, but uh, I am seeing this as the opportunity to move away from complaint only. So that inspector that's doing 200 regular routine inspections a year and all the follow-up and prep work that's needed for that is also dealing with other things when they see trash containers and when they see cars parked all over the place and, and couches out in the yard. I'm expecting inspectors, those two additional inspectors to have a presence out there in the town, not sitting in the office waiting for a complaint to come in. Right. And I did just want to say with the owner, I, I completely agree with what Pat said. Um, we owner occupants need to take out a need to, a permit. And I don't think they should, you know, to be there, there is a, I think even a growing issue of trying to determine who's truly an owner occupant. Um, you know, we, we, as Rob knows, there's a famous incident with an owner who would appear at like planning board and give his address at, at a, um, in Longmeadow, but said he was living in a house he was renting to nine students and it was not owner occupied. But um, I was just maybe trying to get to the retired couple who's you know renting out an ADU or room in their house and maybe as paying a more nominal fee as an owner occupant, but maybe we just say there's a certain fee for five units and under and that would you know, not be so burdensome for the person who's renting out a room or they, you know, converted, they've added onto their garage to be an ADU. That's all. Thank right. you. We're gonna move on because we have a start time for a specific thing at 5.30. So we're gonna try and get through the rest of our agenda now. Obviously we're not done these conversations. Um, we're gonna go to minutes. We have two sets of minutes to adopt December 15th, 2022, regular meeting minutes and December 20th, 2022 special meeting minutes. Are there any requested changes to either of those minutes? I am not seeing any. And so um, I'm gonna make a motion to adopt the December 15th, 2022 meeting minutes and the December 20th, 2022 special meeting minutes as presented. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Jennifer, for seconding. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, um, we're going to vote. Pat. Aye. Mandy is an aye. Pam. <laughs> Sorry, I, I tried to unmute. Aye. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you'd get Got there, it. Jennifer. <laughs> aye. Thank you. That is four zero with one absent. Those minutes are adopted. At this time, we're going to move to general public comment. Um, Rob and John, I just want to say for now, you guys are welcome to stay for both general public comment and the next hour. The hour after this will be a discussion with um, our assessor about assessments on residential rental properties, particular rent, rent residential properties in particular rent rentals, but um, other questions. And you're welcome to say, stay, but you don't have to, depending on what you want to do. Um, but thank you for your time for this first hour um, before we move to general public comment. We appreciate you taking the time to come to all of these meetings to discuss all of this with us. Um, at this time, we're going to move to general public comment. So public comments on matters within the jurisdiction of the Community Resources Committee will be accepted at this time. If you would like to make a public comment, please raise your hand um, in the audience. If you would like to make a general public comment, please raise your hand at this time. Um, and then I will determine and people will be able to make their comments for up to three minutes um, if they would like to make general public comment. We might get 10 more minutes of discussing uh, fees. <laughs> Seeing no general public comment at this time, we are closing public comment. And since we cannot start the next meeting until 5.30. Um, there is one. There is one hand. There we go. A late hand. So Patrick Caymans, please unmute yourself and um, state your name and where you live or who you represent and make your public comment. Thank you, Mandy Joe. Um, Patrick Caymans, Caymans Real Estate, uh, property management uh, owner in the town. Um, 
last meeting, I wasn't able to uh, discuss the uh, energy conservation piece of it because it wasn't provided. Um, you said I have a couple seconds to discuss that. Um, in reviewing it now, I feel more um, confident. That's not part of the health and safety of the um, bylaw. And so I'm not sure that the energy conservation should be a part of it at all because it's not part of the charge of the health and safety of the rental stock in town. Um, so that's a comment to last meetings that you afforded me to give a couple seconds to. Uh, thank you for allowing me that. Um, as far as the fees, obviously I'm not excited about um, my industry being taxed almost a half a million dollars for um, additional fees, et cetera. Um, I'm not sure what we as landlords gain from the half a million dollar fees. Um, I, I brought this up, you know, nine years ago, of course. And, you know, I, I understand, I'm not sure why this wouldn't be a tax that would be paid by the entire um, tax paying population of the town of Amherst. If uh, the building department feels that every unit should be inspected, um, I would think that that would be a burden of the entire taxpayers, not just um, the population that you're picking on. For instance, you know, gas stations, you know, they have to be inspected. Um, restaurants, they have to be inspected. I'm not sure that um, additional taxes are placed on them. So I'm not sure why this is being a burden to just my industry which I believe the industry is probably the largest tax paying group in the town of Amherst. Um, there's a lot of people that are looking for um, affordable housing in the town of Amherst and to tax my industry another half a million dollars is not a good step in the way of uh, affordable housing in the town of Amherst. Um, I appreciate all the efforts that you've made and I appreciate the way we're going and I appreciate um, how you guys have thinned this down and thank you for listening to my comments tonight. Thank you for your comments, Patrick. We appreciate them. Um, we just got one other hand. So Renata Shepard, please unmute yourself and state your name, where you live and make your comment. Hi, Renata Shepard from Justice Drive in Amherst. Um, I totally agree with Patrick. It, it is a lot of taxation. And uh, every, every time I look at, um, proposals, you know, earlier on, I was very hopeful uh, and saying, oh, instead of a $250, you know, in my unit that's, you know, rented below um, market, um, I, I was, you know, excited to, to see that it would probably drop, you know, back to $100 and maybe be inspected every three years included in that price. And that doesn't look like it's gonna happen. I'm very frustrated. Um, and also I have a question in terms of the long-term, uh, if you have a long-term tenant that, you know, if you in, in a good property might be inspected every five years and then with every turnover, I don't understand if it's with every turnover because suppose that I'm unlucky enough to have somebody, you know, moving every year. I'm gonna be paying extra every year just because you know it, it, it seems like a penalty. So how do I avoid that? There's no avoiding it. Um, and being a small landlord, um, it, it just seems unreasonable and unfair. Um, I, I'm just hoping that you know things get better with these discussions and um, that's all. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Renata. Um, with that, public comment is closed at this time. I'm going to make our announcements, the next agenda announcements and preview, and then we will move on to the opening the Council and Finance Committee special meetings um, and all. So there aren't any announcements per se. Um, I had two items in our agenda as next agenda preview. Um, next next agenda itself on the 26th um, will be back to the engagement report and uh, hopefully reviewing the draft nuisance property bylaw um, that I discussed. So we'll take a little bit of a break from the actual regulations bylaw and fees on this bylaw, move to nuisance property and come back to this bylaw in February. Um, 
at this point, that is the tentative. Um, we just had another referral to this committee for a public hearing on um, some some duplex and triplex proposals and zoning bylaw changes. I will be working with the planning department to determine when those hearings are. It sounds like the planning board's hearings will be in February, um, late February at the earliest, if not March. And we have until April 1 to open those hearings. It probably will be somewhere in March where we do that. But we might take some time in February to discuss that before we actually have a hearing. Um, so I'll keep you updated on that. And then there is a tentative date of February 13th for our what I would hope is our last public forum on the residential rental bylaw, a last listening session, I guess I would say, on all of this packet and all. That is the only date Monday in February that is available. I don't know whether it is an appropriate one and whether we'll be ready in time. So I would like people's thoughts on that um, as to whether we think that's a good time to do it. Um, I think we can put the bylaw and regulations that we've reviewed out there for that, and then maybe the nuisance property, but I don't know whether fees will be ready in time. Um, so thoughts on that. And Pat, you have your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to say, because you brought up the 26th, I'm having surgery on the 25th, and I do not know what state I will be in. So it's very possible I'll be missing that meeting. Thank you for that. And we hope all goes well with that surgery. Um, does does everyone okay, is okay with the February thirteenth meeting, or ten? So I can turn it from tentative to the listening session. It would be a Monday night. It's the only Monday in February that's available that's not a holiday or a council meeting. <laughs> so we will turn that from tentative to planned. Um, and with that, um, we're going to break for about thirty seconds as we confirm that we've got everyone here for, now it's 5.30, if we've got quorum. So um, Bernie's here. Andy, do you have a quorum of finance committee present? I need to ask that whoever is controlling the meeting bring Alicia oh, Walker. Alicia was just brought in. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, because uh, according to uh, Athena, a quorum, is a majority of the committee, not a majority of the voting members. Uh, so that we I, we do have a quorum present. Would you like to call that meeting to order now then and do all of your stuff? Yes, I, yes, I uh, will call the meeting to order. And uh, I'm sure that you have provided prior notice that uh, pursuant to um, chapter 20A of the Acts of 20, 21 is extended uh, that this meeting is being held by uh, remote means and uh, have uh, given notice that it's uh, being recorded. And uh, so I'll just quickly uh, make sure that my count is right and that um, people can be heard. I know that there are a couple of people who could not attend, um, but Lynn Griesmer. Present. I know that Bob Hegner is not here. Um, Matt Holloway might be joining. Um, he's going to try to be joining, but he thought he'd be a few minutes late. I will keep an eye out for him. Bernie Kubiak. Present. Andy, unfortunately, I have a hard stop at 630. We'll be done by then. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Promise. And, uh, Michelle Miller, I don't think is here. I don't see her. Yep, uh, Kathy Shane is here. Kathy? Yep, I'm here. Thanks. And uh, Alicia Walker? Here. Yes, so um, that constitutes five of eight members, and therefore it is a quorum of the committee. And uh, so the meeting is in order. One other thing that I just want to let you know real quickly. And then I'm turning it back to you, of course, Mandy, because you're chairing today. Um, and that is that uh, Sean had asked me to send any questions that I had about what we're going to be talking about in advance. I did. He forwarded to them to Kim, um, but I was encouraging that um, they be present, the information be presented as a part of the presentation tonight. But if there is any reference to 
questions that I posed, I wanted to disclose that in advance so that you'd know. So thank you, Mandy, and I'm going to mute myself now. Thank you, Andy. Lynn, please call the council to order and check. I think there's only one counselor you need to check. <laughs> I think that's correct. Uh, given that we have a quorum of the council present, I'm calling the council meeting to order at this time. And I would like to check on whether or not um, Anna Devlin Gothier can hear us. I can. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thanks. So thank you. Um, and so for our minute taker, um, the counselors that are not present for the town council meeting are Michelle Miller, um, let's see, uh, Dorothy Pam, Shalini, Shalini, which Kelly already has. Um, and is, is that it? Anika. Anika, sorry, Anika Lopes. Um, Nine and four. Yep, that, that's it. Okay. Um, we also welcome uh, Sean Mangano, our finance director, um, Kim Yu, our principal assessor, um, and Paul. Paul, yeah, I was like, where did Paul go? Paul is here. Paul Bachman, the town manager. Um, and Dave Zobeck, who is the assistant town manager, has been here the whole time. So um, with that, um, Kim, where did Kim go? I'm here. Oh, there you are. <laughs> I can't find you on my own screen. Um, I'm going to turn this over to you. I heard you have a short presentation for us before we I, go to questions. I do. Am I able to share my screen? You should be able to. Perfect. Okay. I think. Bear with me for a moment. There you go. Yep. Okay, wonderful. So thank you for having me tonight. I'm glad to be able to discuss this with you guys. Um, so as you know, we will be discussing our valuation methods. Um, so the purpose of this presentation tonight is to review how properties are assessed uh, for local property tax, to understand the difference between residential and commercial properties, and then to understand the difference between the market approach, the income and approach, and I just briefly have to touch on the cost approach since that's one that we use. Um, so we will start out with this slide, which many of you may recognize from our classification hearing. Um, I will just briefly touch on personal property and um, industrial property. Um, these are definitions that are given to us by the Department of Revenue. So this is how we classify each type of parcel that we will be valuing. Um, so I've highlighted the residential and the commercial property, and I just want to go over those quickly. Um, so the commercial property uh, by DOR standards includes property held for the purpose of conducting a business, such as stores, office buildings, hotels, and all vacant classified land as chapter land. So chapter 61A, 61B, and um, chapter 61. Um, so those are basically all farmland or land as recreational, which is left at its natural state. Um, Residential property includes all property containing one or more units used for human habilitation. The class uh, includes accessory land and buildings such as swimming pools, tennis courts, garages, and sheds, et cetera. Um, and single family homes are the, the largest part of the class, um, but this also does include large apartment buildings, um, two and three family homes, as well as condos. Um, so it just, this is really important because these um, as I had mentioned, are definitions given to us by the Department of Revenue um, on to how we actually have to classify each of our properties. Um, so moving on, something that I thought was really important um, to talk about tonight was mass appraisal and what basically that means. Um, just because we live in Massachusetts, it doesn't actually have anything to do with us. Mass appraisal is just a group as a whole. Um, and basically, it is the um, standard procedure for how we um, collect data, um, how we appraise properties, and um, value uniformly. Um, we just want to make sure that everything is equitable. Um, and we use the same common data, um, the same methods. Um, we do on each and every class of property and type of property. Um, we do statistical testing, um, you know, just making sure that everything is equitable. Um, so in short, basically, that's what that explains there. 
um, how we actually, to, to get into sort of the nitty gritty, um, how we determine how property is assessed um, is basically to find out what the full and fair cash value is. Um, so how do we get there? Um, we, um, we get to the full and fair cash value by knowing what a willing buyer and a willing seller will pay um, or sell a parcel for in the market. Um, and this is something that we absolutely must know. Um, so to get there, um, we have to collect data and then analyze the data. Um, and the goal of that is just to estimate the full and fair cash value. So we're trying to figure out what is the um, what is the what is the sale price, uh, what is the assessed value of each and every property, um, and so again that will include different methods. Um, we look at different ways to value the properties, which is what I will get into in the next couple of slides. Um, we look at zoning, we look at conditions of um, the economy, we look at um, you know anything that could basically affect the value of that that property. Um, so some of those approaches that we look at, um, the three most common are the market, the income, and the cost. Um, so again, I will get into that into the next slide, but something else that I think is really important to point out is that um, the assessors may not take into consideration who owns and occupies any parcel that, that we're valuing. The goal is to value the land and anything that sits on the land. It does not matter to us um, who owns or occupies the property. So here um, we have our different methods of assessment. So the most common and most simple approach um, is gonna be our market approach. Um, so this is basically um, looking at the market, seeing, you know, studying the sales that are happening. Um, it just so happens uh, the most common sale is a single family, two family, three family, and commercial, and a, um, excuse me, a uh, condo. Um, so we look at those sales, we look at comparables to each of, and every one of those properties. Um, we break it down to residential, um, inside of the residential class, we break it down to single family, two family, three family, so on and so forth. And then even inside of that class, we break it down to style of house. So farmhouse, Cape, um, Victorian, so on and so forth. And we do the studies based on those. Um, we do, as I had mentioned, um, in, in every town um, in Massachusetts, the, generally speaking, there are many more sales of this type of property rather than the larger buildings, such as apartment buildings, um, the commercial industrial and retail. Um, so this market approach is much preferred for the um, higher volume of data. Um, so onto the income approach, which is a little bit more complex. Um, the income approach is um, basically established by um, looking at people's income and expense information. And I do have some examples to show you in some future slides. So um, if this is a lot looking at these words, uh, I will break this down a little bit more for you uh, coming up. Um, so the most common properties to be looked at with the income approach are apartment buildings, offices, retail buildings, um, and often the, um, the industrial buildings as well. Um, so the formula is taking the net operating income and dividing that by the capitalization rate to set the value. Um, so what is a net operating income? That is the um, information that is provided on the income and expense form where the person tells us what they make per apartment um, or as a whole on their apartment building. Um, so it's it, their potential gross income um, is the next thing that we, we take into consideration. Um, so we do a calculation to get to this point um, by taking away um, vacancy, uh, potential vacancy, we take away their expenses, um, and any sort of miscellaneous uh, income we look at as well. So um, something that I put on here was the vending machines and the parking spots. Um, this could be a number of different types of things. There could be ATM fees, or excuse me, not fees, but ATM machines in buildings and um, things like that. Um, so again, we take away the vacancy, 
um, and and again those those expenses. Um, so then we take the net operating income, divide that by the capitalization rate, um, and we figure out what their percentage is to get their value. Um, so I know this is a lot. And again, I will show you some actual data on the next slide. Um, so hopefully that will help you to understand. I know this one is a little bit confusing. Um, and something to think about as well is when we get these income and expense forms from uh, um, all of these people who um, own and occupy or own um, uh, resident, uh, excuse me, commercial buildings and apartment buildings, industrial buildings. Um, we we look at the whole. We don't look at each and individual parcel. Um, so when we when we get the data, we basically come up with an average to see, uh, you know, are our values falling within that average um, for that type of property? Um, but again, you know, if there's something that's sticking out there in those properties, we're going to take a look at that. And we do look, but but that information is not based individually on each and every piece of in, of um, of data that's given on that form. Um, so just briefly to touch on the cost approach, um, this is something that's pretty infrequently used um, in the assessing world. It's it's really best used on brand new properties when there isn't the sufficient. Um, market information on those. Um, so typically specialized properties. So um, battery storage for solar right now is something that assessors are using the cost approach on. Um, something that we had used it in the past was for the solar panels. Um, I think many assessors had used it on buildings for um, marijuana dispensaries when they were brand new as well, because there wasn't really a clear path as to how to value those properties. Um, were they commercial? you know, were they medical? Um, so often the cost approach is used um, when we're not exactly sure the best way to value as well as not really having sufficient market data for that particular type of property. Um, so again, I hope that the next couple of slides will clear this up for you can, um, can with the you income. To, before you go to the next slide, can I ask you to um, just add a couple more pieces? Can you just say quickly in Amherst, what types of properties we use the income approach um, in terms of the number of units. And then can you um, talk about the capitalization rate a little bit more and what we typically use in Amherst and, and a Absolutely. little bit more about what that is? Yep, yep. Um, so typically we use the income approach for all commercial industrial properties, as I had mentioned, but we also use it for apartment buildings of four or more. Um, and the reason again for that is just because there is not a sufficient number of sales that occur with all of those types of properties. Um, so again, any apartments of four or more, any commercial industrial properties. Um, so that's just not something, we just don't have the sufficient data market-wise to be able to use that. And that's why we use the income approach on that. So three um, units three units and less, we use the market approach and four units or more, we generally use the income approach, right? Correct. Okay. Correct. Yep. Um, so the cap rate that we generally use um, in, in Amherst is about 9%. Um, and again, that's the net operating income divided by um, the assessed value. Um, and so we, you know, when doing these future calculations that I will show you in a moment, um, we generally try to keep it around the 9%, like I had mentioned. Um, but again, you know, when we do our revaluation, we will look at these each and every year, but, but especially during the revaluation to make sure that that cap rate um, you know, is in line with everything um, and adjust that as as need be. Um, so, so another way to think about the cap rate is sort of like a return on investment. Um, yes. How much did, you know, what was the total cost of your investment? And, and then annually, what percentage return are you expected to get back um, is another way to think about it. Yes, exactly. Okay, um, so moving on, um, this slide is just to show you that no matter how we value properties, whether it be the income and expense, whether it be the cost, whether it be um, sales, we always have to look back to the median sales ratio. Um, so we have to be within, for every single class, we have to be within a 10% range of the uh, median assessment to sales ratio. So, um, Basically, what that means is if we find that our single family homes uh, range within, we'll just give an easy figure of $500,000, 
um, our, our single family class has to be within 10%, uh, give or take, depending on the style of home, give or take, depending on the condition of the property, um, a 10% range of that $500,000. Um, so that's something really important to think about because if we start to value property differently, for example, in, this, in the single family class um, parcels, if we start valuing those um, income and expense methods on the properties that are rented, uh, and then we also value those that are owner occupied based on the sales, um, you know, you may not come out at that perfect 10%. Um, if you have, you know, a neighborhood, for example, that's more than 10% or less than 10%, the state is going to come in and say, you know, what's going on here? Why is this neighborhood being valued higher than the rest? Um, can you, you know, what's your explanation? And likely they will ask that we change the method to get them back in line with everyone else. Um, so again, across the board, we need to be within 10% of the median sales assessment ratio. Um, so sort of just to reiterate what I've just said, the DOR does frown upon us using alternate methods within the same class uh, of property, just because they want us to accurately represent the fair market value. And they feel as though, um, you know, doing it, valuing each parcel differently um, by a different method would not be an accurate representation. Um, it's just, it's really just best practice to keep everything um, valued the same within that same class. Um, so here's a little bit of our data. So hopefully this is the beginning of helping you to understand um, the, the um, income approach. Um, so our total number of residential parcels is 5,070 parcels. Now this includes single family homes, two family homes, three family homes, apartments of four or more, as well as vacant land and out, uh, uh, land with outbuildings on them. So I have this broken down for you to show you that there are 4,112 single family homes in the town of Amherst. 349 two families, 79 three families, 100 apartment buildings, and 438 pieces of property that are vacant and or have an outbuilding on them. Um, and I had spoken with the um, building department and found out that it's approximately 700 single family homes that are registered um, in the town for rentals um, as of this year. So um, just a quick little graph to kind of give you a visual of what the breakdown looks like. And then um, next here is going to give you some figures. So this is going to help you to sort of figure out how things work. Um, so is it going to help us to value property um, based on the income approach? Not necessarily. Um, and the reason is, is that you can see here, um, these particular two and three family homes um, would be valued at a lesser uh, value and taxed at a lesser rate, um, giving us less revenue here. Um, unfortunately, I don't have access to a whole lot of data for three, two, three family, two family, and single family homes because they're not required to provide this information based on state regulations. Um, but I did just so happen to have these, and I thought that it would be um, a great comparison here for you. So um, just to break down a few, we have the very top one, their projected income after removing their expenses, um, taking the 5% vacancy uh, would be $29,070, which would in turn create their value of $323 based on the income and expense. So taxes would be $6,400. Whereas if we use the market approach and we look at sales, it's much higher number at 449,900, excuse me, 440,900. Um, so that's giving us $8,800 uh, $8, in taxes. Um, so as you can see, that's quite a bit of a difference. Um, I'm giving you total bedroom count um, and total number of livable square feet, just as a comparison, because I can't tell you which properties these are um, exactly. Um, I just thought it would be a nice comparison to be able to at least see size-wise uh, similarity with these here. So um, we'll just jump down to the first two-family home. Again, the projected income for this property would be $21,981. Um, using that, that 
income approach, we have a value of $323,025, with the difference being the sales approach value of almost $500,000. So it's a pretty big difference on these particular ones. You know, would there be other parcels um, in the two and three family homes, as well as the single family homes that maybe went the other way where their rents are higher? Sure, absolutely. That's a possibility. Um, but these were the only ones that I actually had access to. Um, they happened to turn in income and expense paperwork last year. So these are actual figures that people had represented um, using our tax rate um, of $20.10 per thousand to get these figures. So um, I'm sure there'll probably be some questions on here, but I'm just going to keep going and I can always bring this slide back up if need be. Kim, can I say one thing quickly? Sure. Um, and, and one other thing just to keep in mind is regardless of what method you use, it, it's not going to change the overall tax levy. It's not going to bring in more revenue to the town. It's just going to change how that tax levy is maybe divvied up. Um, but choosing one method over another doesn't increase or decrease the tax levy. Right. And we'll take questions when Kim finishes the presentation. Yes. Yes, so um, here I just wanted to display in this um, picture of basically what it looks like, the difference between owner-occupied and non-owner-occupied. Um, so, and I just wanna make it clear that owner-occupied parcels are someone's domicile. So it's someone's permanent residence. They live here all year round, whereas non-owner-occupied parcels are not someone's domicile and they would live either in another town in Massachusetts, another town or another building um, in Amherst, or maybe they live in another state altogether. Um, and then I also wanna make it very clear that that 33% of non-owner occupied parcels also includes those um, 400, uh, 438 parcels of vacant land as well. Um, Cause obviously we can't, we can't tent on one of those and call that our domicile. So, <laughs> um, so just really important figure there to, to look at. Um, you know, to see the difference between the owner occupied and non owner occupied. Um, and that's it for today. Thank you, Kim, for the of presentation. Course. We are going to take questions now. Um, and so I would ask the the committee member, everyone who's a panelist, if they have questions to raise their hands, and I'm going to try and go down in the direct order. Kim, you might want to stop sharing Oops. your screen. I can't figure out how, <laughs> sorry. I, it somehow kicked me. I'll just pop this back up there. <laughs> sorry about that. There, there's a icon usually up at the right that says stop sharing. There you Thank go. you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, with that, we're gonna start with. With me? Yes. I have just a really quick question and it's curiosity. How do we, um, is a mixed use building where the lower floor is all commercial and the rest is residential, is that considered residential versus or what? How is so, that dealt with? <laughs> that is actually considered a mixed use building. So that was great terminology there. Um, so we would value uh, the commercial. We're going to look at the income and expense on a, on a mixed use building because um, it's a possibility that there's going to be rentals in that building, whether that be on the commercial side, maybe it has multiple commercial businesses on the bottom, but it only has one single residence. Maybe that residence is owner occupied. Um, so there would not be income and expense data on that part, but there's still going to be income and expense data on the on the commercial parts. Um, and that could go vice versa as well. So if there were more residential units and it wasn't owner occupied, then it wouldn't change the category. It, um, it's still going to stay as mixed use. It's still going to be looked at with the income and expense method, because um, even if there's more um, residential pieces to it than commercial, um, but just because there is the opportunity for um, for commercial space and, and the rental space on that particular property, it would be considered uh, mixed use and again, used with the income and expense. Thank you. And that's mm -hmm. another one that there's probably not a lot of sales to, to do a sales approach because they're, Absolutely. They, they don't turn over all that often. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Pretty much anything that has commercial involved with it, um, you know, storefronts, offices, things like that will be considered with, will, will be used the, um, the income and expense. Thank you. Kathy. 
Um, I, it looks to me like Pam might be set. Uh, Pam might be second, but it's okay. I, I'm ready. Okay, so I'm <laughs> just building on the the first question, Kim. Um, if if the ownership of the mixed use building is different on the first floor than on all the apartments up above, are you are there two separate tax bills then? Um, so it, that's a that's a difficult question because um, if there's a building that has um, separation, so if it if it's one building all stuck together, there's commercial on the bottom, residential on the top, but there's different owners, it's generally going to be listed as condos. And in that case, if they're commercial uh, condos, then yes, we'd absolutely be using the income and expense method. Um, however, if the top floor is fully residential and it's just that way across the whole board, um, there's no, you know, it, each of them has their own individual ownership, then um, those would be valued using the sales method. Okay, I'm, I'll be more specific. Up in, okay. North, up in North Amherst, we have a very large apartment complex um, and Beacon owns the top floor and Coles Jones owns the bottom floor. Um, they're they're separate and they're not condos. So would you do and I, and then let me just follow it up with if if the commercial space is vacant, so that would apply to one of the downtown buildings where they intend to have something, but there's no. Do you value it on potential income, or do you take the fact that there is no income for that space. So what do you do with, and that question goes for either of them, that it's mm -hmm. space ready to be rented. Um, sure, sure. So if there's vacancy in a parcel, um, whether it be commercial or whether it be residential, um, we would hope that the landlord would tell us that on the income and expense form, just so that we're aware. Um, it is something that we would consider but also we're going to look for long-term vacancy. Um, vacancy is not necessarily going to affect your assessment um, unless it's long-term. Um, if you're having trouble renting a property, then yeah, we're going to consider that and we're going to see you know, what's going on. For example, during COVID, there was a lot of vacancy um, and that may have affected the commercial um, buildings because there was just nobody, You know, people were working from home, they didn't need the office space anymore there may be still some result of that. So there may be in the future, there may be an issue with long-term vacancy um, in, in commercial buildings. As for residential buildings, um, I've never really seen an issue with long-term um, vacancy, but again, it would still be looked at the same way if there's long-term vacancy. And for some reason, these buildings are not being rented, uh, you know, then we would we would take that into consideration. But generally speaking, there is some vacancy in every building, um, you know, which is why when we're doing the income approach, we do take at least a 5% um, reduction with that. Um, and then as for the building um, over at Kohl's, I'm not, I'm not quite familiar with that building. And so I'd like to do some research and be able to get back to you on that. Um, it may not appear to be, um, a condo, um, and it it may actually be a condo. So I, I would like to get some more information on that one and get back to you if, if that's okay. Uh, that's fine. Um, can I just, okay. I have one more, you know, you've divided sure. them up, just building on the same, this is the multiple unit one. A townhouse that has 10 separate units, are mm -hmm. each of them a separate single family or is it, a, is it, how does a townhouse work? So a townhouse would work as, for example, if it has four units within it, it would be considered an apartment building um, unless those units were separated out into condos. Um, so if it if it has three units, then it would be considered a three family. If it has you know eight units, then it would be considered an apartment building. Um, it may not look like an apartment building, um, but it would still be classified as one of those. But if you classify it as condo, it means there's an owner for each of the units. Is that why you're distinguishing them? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Although, you know, I mean, an owner could own potentially multiple units, but there's the classification where um, there's a condo association. Um, so it's intended to have separate owners. Thank you. You're welcome. Pam. Uh, 
Thanks. So actually back to that vacancy rate um, in using 5%, I'm thinking about Amherst as a, um, as a college town with a lot of people looking for housing. Um, I thought the vacancy rate was really much, much lower, more around, I don't know, half a percent or something like that. Perhaps we should consider um, using a different number, especially if it's dealing with the residential portion of a building as opposed to the commercial. Um, another question is back to your, your cap rate that you use of 9%. So is that is that simply what you see across town as an average for those buildings um, for which you use the income and expense method? Is that 9% our number or is it sort of an industry standard number? That number is unique to Amherst. Yes, that is something. Um, I actually had spoken with David about that number just to verify that that was the average and that that's what he has been using in the past. And and yes, that number is unique to Amherst. David, former assessor. Yes, sorry. Yep, for, yep. for 30 David. years or 25 <laughs> years or something. Yeah. We remember, we remember. <laughs> so, so, uh, it must be nice to be on a first name basis. You can throw out a first name and everyone knows. <laughs> Um, I, I thought it was Dave Zomack, so I was like, wow, really broad variety of talents. Oh, <laughs> Thank you. Can I finish my sentence? Go, Pam. Um, so how does, how, just because I don't understand, how does a cap rate get applied? How does that 9% get applied into what? Um, go ahead. No, Kim, Kim, you can answer that question. Okay. Um, so the cap rate, um, I had briefly mentioned um, that cap rate is, basically the net operating income divided yeah. by the assessed value and that helps us figure out um our um lost my words there sorry about that uh, th that helps us to figure out our um oh my goodness i'm sorry i've completely Never. lost your, your, your taxable um, value for the property. Yeah. So you, so you divide the, the net operating income by the capitalization rate. So if it was, let's say, $25,000 and the cap rate's 9%, you divide that 25000 by the 9%, and that will produce what we would then, um, if we were using that method, that would produce the taxable value for that property. Yeah, cause, thank cause you, I thought, I, I thought Kim said that it produces a percentage. The cap rate is a percentage. Um, and you apply cap that to rated, okay that's what I, okay. yeah yeah the, yeah, the cap rate yeah. again think of it like return on investment um you know so if you if the property let's say costs a hundred thousand dollars and the net operating income was ten thousand dollars you'd have a cap rate of roughly ten percent and so it's a way of doing that you look at some examples and then you can apply that across sort of all properties because you can't necessarily calculate it for every single property um, so they develop standard uh, sort of a, a across the board benchmark that they use. And it can be, it's something that can be updated annually. We have a, a consultant that we work with that we can monitor that cap rate to see if it's, um, you know, staying where it should, staying around that 9% range. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank Thanks, Sean. Okay. So um, my question is with mixed use buildings. Um, and I've heard that in a mixed use building, the residential side gets the residential tax rate and the mixed use side gets the mixed use, uh, gets the commercial tax rate, um, the, the commercial side. So most of our mixed use in downtown say the first floor is commercial, second and above is residential. The residential floors would get the residential side of the tax rate, even though we have a tax rate of one or whatever it is. And the, the other side would get the commercial side. And so that's where they're classified. Um, do they have different cap rates? Do they, do you take, do you split when you're doing the assessed value of these? Do you assess the residential side separately with different methods than you do the commercial side of those buildings? So, um, yes, uh, we would look at the commercial side, um, separately, but we also do look at it as a whole as well. Um, so it's sort of, it's sort of a rounded figure to be accurate for, rep, you know, representing the, the commercial piece of it, but it's also, um, you know, a piece of it is going to be the residential, because if you value the parcel just as a whole, um, then, you know, someone may say, well, what, how much is the commercial piece valued at? And you can't, you know, you can't come up with that figure. So, um, 
and you also don't want to overvalue that piece of the property. So yes, that is um, done separately. Okay, thank you. Lynn. First of all, thanks, me and Joe. And uh, Tim, thanks for this um, lesson for all of us. Uh, I want to focus on two different issues. First of all, is condos. So suppose we have a condo association. Suppose that condo association has 100 units. And, you know, some people have lived in that association for years and others just sold. And um, how do you value each of the individual condos? And because they do receive individual tax bills. Are we continually upgrading based on the most recent sales of those condos? Yes. And okay. And when you use the hundred uh, apartment building number, those don't include condos, right? Or do they? I'm sorry. Can you say that one more time? When you back before you had uh, like apartment buildings, there were like in Amherst. Mm -hmm. Okay. Does that include? Oh, no, 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 that's something completely separate. So condos okay. on my, on my um, slides, condos are considered a 102 um, with the land use code. So those are completely okay. separate. So those, um, I don't think I actually included those um, in my figuring. Um, but I can get you, if you were interested in how many condos we have, I can certainly get you that figure. Well, I'm I'm just interested because there there is a condo market in Amherst. Interestingly enough, it mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily appreciate at the same rate that um, ha single houses do. Totally separate subject. The university yeah. is building this new public-private partnership. Two sets of whatever. Yes. How is that taxed? Um, so that's something that we're working on. We need to look at some of the um, agreements and ownership of that. So at the moment, I don't have the answer for that. Um, okay. But what I can tell you is when we are looking at condos, um, valuation is based on the interior of each and individual, each and every individual condo. Um, so anything that's on the outside, the hallway, um, any decks or anything that's included is not considered for that individual unit unless it is um, written that way in their master deed. Um, so so each and every condo is updated whether or not along with any um, any property in town actually is updated um, each year whether or not it has sold. Um, so someone could have been in their home, whether it be condo or single family for 50 years, um, but their assessment is still going to increase or decrease depending on what's happening in the market. So let me just stick with condos then for a moment later on when we're more clear about how, how we're going to deal with the new uh, dorms. Uh, we'll come back to that. Um, so suppose you have a condo um, association. It's got 100 units and it also has, you know, lovely balconies and a pool and maybe a common room. How are they assessed and how do they pay taxes? So if there's common room, as you had mentioned, a pool, things like that, um, they do not necessarily get an individual tax bill. Um, those are put onto the main condo record card. Uh, however, those things, depending on how the master deed is written, um, generally, like, like I had mentioned, those are common space. Um, so those basically are uh, an amenity that would be considered in the sale price of each and individual condo. Okay. So the value, although it's okay. not a separate value from each, you know, unit, it's sort of all, you know, included in each and individual unit. Okay. Thank you. You're and welcome. I, I'll be curious down the road how we're going to deal with the public private partnership. Thanks. Jennifer. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I had two questions. First is just kind of cut and dry. Is a rental townhouse development considered an apartment? A rental townhouse? Well, I guess it would be, it, it would depend on it, how many units there are and um, 
how, you know, is it one single building with units in it or is it multiple buildings on one piece of property? So um, it's not built yet, but it's been permitted. Like the Sunset Fearing, everyone thinks of it as a townhouse. So it's mm -hmm. like, I think five buildings, but within them, they have more than one unit. Yes, so that would be considered an apartment building. It is an apartment, okay. Yes. It just look, It's an apartment that looks like townhouses. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Basically, uh -huh. although something may have only four units and look like a townhouse, or you right. know, it could have multiple, um, just because the fact that it has more units than four, it would be considered for assessment purposes as an apartment. Kim, is a, is a townhouse a type of parcel? Is a townhouse a type of parcel? Right. We, uh, the townhouse has been brought up several times. I just want to clarify. Is it um, in the chart you showed, um, you have single family, two family, three family. There's no townhouse oh. classification. No. Right. So that's why you're asking how many units are in it, because it's gonna that's going to determine what classification it falls under, correct? That's correct. Yes. So that's why when you keep asking about townhouses, that, that's not a... Right. Um, it, it may help with the value and how it's being valued, but it's not a specific classification of property. Right. No, it's interesting because people in their minds distinguish between the two. When they're, so that's good to know. Um, as <laughs> excuse me, Pam mentioned that the, so if we're using a 5% vacancy rate, if in fact over time we see that Amherst has a lower vacancy rate mm -hmm. and that might increase the assessment of the property, I mean, is that something we might look at? Would it be an increase that might be significant? Significant, I can't say yes or no, yeah. um, but absolutely something that we would be looking at and something that we should be looking at every year. Um, these that happen? This, this particular chart, I just used that because, again, looking at the town, obviously we don't generally have a lot of vacancies is my assumption. Um, so we just picked a low number as 5%. But I can hear what you're saying where, you know, maybe it is lower for Amherst. Um, and that can be a study that's done, you know, in the future. And yes, that does happen um, here in Amherst. So this was just sort of a to throw out some figures for you. So the 5% um, is not necessarily the exact number that we would use when actually valuing um, for the state purposes for the end of the fiscal year. This was just for, um, for purposes of this presentation. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Pam. Thanks. Um, and again, I really appreciate your clarification of, of valuing uh, rental properties. Um, and, but I, I would love to see the, the, not the 5% being um, included in, in that, but something a much lower percentage. Um, back to mixed use buildings. If are you running the numbers in a way that does look at the very, I'm going to say, profitable rental uh, apartment rental units compared to the commercial floor, which we know going forward is, you know, not what maybe 30% of the ground floor. Um, I don't want to be cynical, but if I had a big building that had a vacant and uh, underperforming commercial space, but I had a very, um, very productive residential component. Are we separating those out so that um, we are valuing that building at full potential um, based on the residential component? Thank you. So again, we would separate the two pieces so that the um, commercial section of the building will have a separate value and it may be a lower value than, for example, a building next door that has a full um, lineup on the on the bottom floor. Uh, and then on the top floor where it's or the top floors um, where it's all residential, if it's if there is a very low vacancy rate there, again, that will have a separate value. Um, and, and we do take that into consideration so that it would be valued um, appropriately based on the, the higher rents and the non vacancy. Does that answer your question, Pam? So, so, so just so I'm sure, so that, that rate of return or the um, uh, the NOI. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is, yeah. Is, that, is that vacant space helping, helping bring that all down? And I'm, again, I'm being, I'm being cynical. Yeah, um, it, yes, and the answer is yes and no. Um, so yes, it's bringing down the piece of the building that's commercial valued, but no, it's not 
bringing down the piece of the building that's residential valued. Overall, is it bringing down a piece of that? Yes. Kim, can um, the, something that might help again, do you do the capitalization rate on, on each individual building or do you do it across a group so that if one individual building, for example, was, you know, try one individual building uh, parcel could not necessarily affect the capitalization rate um, based on vacancy? Um, we do the capitalization rate um, based on an average across the board. So we do a study to figure out, you know, is there one particular building in general that has high vacancy? Um, you know, do we do we take that one into consideration when figuring the capitalization rate or not? Um, you know, so so we do look at each individual um, property, and then we try to figure out should we be including that in all properties, or is it just that particular one? And in the case of of something like that, maybe we value it at its full and fair potential, um, but then we put some sort of a um, reduction of some sort on that one because it has higher vacancy in the commercial section of the building um, so that it wouldn't affect all properties if they're not all being affected by vacancy as as such. But to your, but to your point, Pam, if if they reduce the amount of income that the property generated by keeping it vacant, even if we kept the same capitalization rate, it would reduce the, the taxable value of the property. And again, to that too, if we see that there's high vacancy in a building, if there's one particular building that has a vacancy rate um, year after year after year in, for example, their bottom floor commercial space, um, we will be doing some research as to why. Um, is it, you know, are they asking a lot for rent? Are they in a bad location? Do they have a small space? You know, what is causing that vacancy rate? Um, if we can't figure it out just by eye, we will try to make contact with the owner of the building to find out what's going on there, that they're not getting um, rentals in that building. You know, are they keeping it vacant for some reason? Is there, you know, is there an issue with that unit that's, that's you know, not visible to the eye? You know, what's going on? So we do do some, some research um, if we do see that's happening, because, you know, as you're mentioning, you know, it wouldn't be fair for anyone if one particular owner kept a place vacant just to bring down values. And, and I don't know that anyone would do that in particularly, but at the same time, um, you know, we still have to be fair and equitable to everyone. Thank you. That would be 11 East Pueblo Street. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we have about 10 minutes left. Kathy. Uh, okay. I just, in, in terms of the questions that Pam has been asking, I think, as I understand what your cap rate is, if you decided our vacancy rate was two rather than 5%, that cap rate would be 9% would be something lower. I don't know how much lower, which means which means the valuation would be higher if you think of dividing it by 8% or dividing it by seven. So that's why this distinction is important. And you said you yes. take, if there's one really big space that it's vacant and it's an anomaly, you're taking it out is what you said when you're trying to figure out what the overall vacancy rate is. I mean, this has been very helpful <laughs> in, in trying to understand that. Mm -hmm. might not, on, on this issue of townhouses, um, if the townhouse, if there are 10 of them, mm -hmm. each of them is separately owned, that would then be considered condos. You would just, if, you would put if them there's a condo association made, then yes, we would consider those as condos. And likely, if there was ten different owners, that would be the case. Yes, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. That's okay. And we don't in New York. They have a lot of them, but we don't have too many co-ops, right? Where it's even a more complex. They they get their own category. Is that what happens with a? If we had had them, they get their own category. A co-op. So there are 20 units in it, but the co-op association owns. Uh, yes. And so not, and just legally wise, condos are differently than different than co-ops. So it's a co-op. Do, do they have their own line in your complex? So if the condo association or if the, the co-op association, I understand what you mean. They're the ones who sort of everybody that lives in them is sort of essentially a part ownership. Um, I believe those would go in as um apartment complexes uh, because there is really technically one owner which is the well I mean the owner of the association essentially um, there's one tax bill that's generated each individual unit doesn't get a, a tax bill um, so it would be considered 
part of that unit, um, part of an apartment complex, although it is something completely different. Okay, um, so I, that, I don't need to press you on it because I think condo associations, you do sell, you sell your share when you leave. There's a mark, it's, yes. it's in the market value world that's different than the whole building has to be sold or not. So I, I don't need to press you on it, but it is this okay. distinction on, can you look at a market for it or not? And if you can't, then you do the other method. So correct. That, that's been very clear. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. So this has all been very good. Thank you, Kim. Um, I just want to um, confirm that those houses that have been um, res uh, single family homes, but are being rented to one or more tenants are still being uh, assessed on the market approach. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, basically, the reason being is that the as I had mentioned before, um, the assessors assess the land and the buildings that are on the piece of land. We can't assess the ownership. Okay, and I guess the second um, is one that uh, I've raised uh, in my conversations and uh, with Sean, but I think that it's. Uh, um, hard to determine, and that is if we, uh, since as Sean pointed out, under Proposition 2, uh, the amount that we're taxing in the community doesn't change if you change the assessments. It only change it, the changes to the, um, met, to, to the amount that each individual um, owner is paying for their share. Um, and, uh, you know, what kind of an increase would you need to be for, for a more vigilant uh, use of income approach in order to really make an effect of any significant amount to uh, the single family residences? It would seem that it would uh, not be likely to have a large effect, um, except for the very large buildings, which you're, you're already working on. Right. right now, based on the chart that um, the examples that Kim's looked at, if we were to value those properties using the income approach, it would actually increase the tax, uh, the individual taxes paid by um, those that are not using the income approach, um, using the sales approach, because they all actually result in less taxes being paid using the income approach. So. Um, so there may, again, as Kim said, there, there may be others. We only looked at a, a handful of them. There may be others where it goes the other way. But as of right now, based on the numbers we're seeing, there's nothing conclusive that would say using the income approach would, would shift taxes um, towards rentals. Thank you. So I have, I have one question, and I don't know whether it might end up being the last one, um, which is the income approach. You said the owners report the income. Um, and so I'm curious what kind of checking on that is done and how is it reported is it in you know is it sort of reported as um what they file their taxes on like how is it reported because we've heard you know that that sometimes uh on the residential side that there might be um four bedrooms in say a residential in, in an apartment in or two bedrooms in an apartment but they're collecting rent from three or four individuals on an individual basis instead of a unit basis but only two of those individuals might be on a lease or something and so how are you checking to make sure that the income numbers presented are essentially reasonable for that building that is saying this is the income we have to ensure that they're not under reporting that and therefore ending up with a lower assessed value than they should. So um, there is a state form that goes out every year uh, for income and expense for all properties that would need it. Um, so just briefly, uh, commercial, industrial, uh, apartments of four or more. Um, so that is sent out in the beginning of the year and it is an honor system. Um, those people who fill those out give us a different variety of responses. Um, some people actually physically fill out the form. Some people give us their um, paperwork that they've submitted to their accounting firm 
Um, and sometimes we don't get those until later in the year. So we generally, those forms, I feel like um, if they're being submitted to the accountant, that's what they're submitting for their taxes. Um, but it is an honor system. Um, you know, if we see something where we feel like this is a huge building and it's not making a lot of money, for example, we might look a little bit more into it, but we do have to honor that what they're providing for information is correct. However, with that being said, um, if we are looking at our sales analysis and we're looking at our values and we're comparing, um, you know, we're, for example, we're looking at all um, large apartment buildings. So anything for or more apartments. And we see that there's an outlier, whether it be way higher or way lower than the rest. We're going to pick that one out. We're going to go back and look at their income and expense. Did we get it, first of all? Um, and then we're going to say, okay, you know, what's going on here? Try to analyze this property. If we need to, we're going to try to touch base with the owner and or property management company to try to find out exactly why this property is higher or lower than the rest and what's going on at that property. So actually physically checking the actual numbers on their income and expense form is not something that we do, but we still do some digging if there's something that feels wrong and looks wrong and on paper it's sticking out um, because the DOR is going to do the exact same thing. So we try to just um, cut that off and do it first so that we don't have to wait on their analysis at the end of the year and hold up our tax rate. Okay. Thank you so much. I don't see any other hands and it is the promised 630 that I said we'd adjourn by. I want to thank Kim and Sean and Paul for coming to this. I want to thank Andy for uh, a random conversation that realized both finance and CRC wanted the same thing. Um, so we were able to combine this to, to use more staff time more wisely. Um, but thank you all for coming. Um, I think we're going to go, Lynn, do you want to do first or last? Should you be last or first? <laughs> yeah, I could dismiss this all, by the way. <laughs> um, <laughs> the town council is adjourned. Andy? Finance committee is adjourned. And, and I am adjourning the Community Resources Committee at 630. Thank you all. And thank Kelly for taking the minutes for such a big meeting, multiple meetings. Yeah, of course, it was a it was an interesting challenge. <laughs> <laughs>